it is so great to be with you again as we continue on this journey together. Talking about anchors, those things in our lives that root us, that ground us, things that are, are most monumentally important to who we are and what God is doing in us and among us as a people and as God's kingdom. Um, I know it's going to sound a little bit macabre, but I wanted to introduce you to one of my favorite artists. He's a writer, and I have this thing in my life where I am just really, for whatever reason, drawn to people who have um, a dark side, who really struggle. Um, I find something really moving and beautiful in their art. And so a lot of the artists that I like, a lot of the poets, writers, painters, musicians, um, they're the kinds of people who dabble, who spend a little bit of time, maybe more time than is healthy, on the dark side. And one of those is David Foster Wallace. David Foster Wallace was an author, an essayist, and he is remembered for having written one of the greatest novels of all time. It's this book here. It's called Infinite Jest. And it is a monster. Everybody who knows anything about literature, serious fiction, knows Infinite Jest. A lot of them are like me, who have taken stabs at trying to get into this book. Most people who've ever read it, because it is so long and it's so dense, have had to do it in groups where they just said, like, just take it 50 or 100 pages at a time. Um, it's listed as one of the 100 greatest novels in the English language written by an American. And David Foster Wallace was one of these torn souls in the world. His second most famous book is a book called The Pale King, which he never finished. Because on September 12, 2008, he walked into his basement and arranged the pages of The Pale King that he had put together set them out for someone to find, and then hung himself by his patio rafters. Later, we find out that his wife and father testified to the fact that he suffered from immense and crushing depression. Some of you know what that's like to suffer from really great depression or to have someone in your life who suffers from it. But as heralded as his books are and his essays are, as remembered as he is, the thing that I appreciate most about David Foster Wallace is that he gave us one of the best sermons that's ever been preached. But it wasn't actually a sermon. It was a commencement address. And it was a commencement address that he gave at Kenyon College. And it didn't have a title, but it became extraordinarily famous. You can find it anywhere on the internet that you just look hard enough for. Like you, you can find it everywhere. But most people call it, this is water. And he talks about the idea that fundamentally the thing that we all have, the thing that we most enjoy, the thing that makes us adults, is this ability to choose in every situation how we see the world. And so toward the end of This is, Wallace, this is Water, David Foster Wallace says this. He says, this I submit is the freedom of real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get, to, you get to decide what to worship. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it Jesus Christ or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan mother goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some invaluable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body 
and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already, Foster says. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They are the default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into, day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. And the so-called real world will not discourage you from operating on your default setting because the so-called real world of men and money and power hums merrily along in a pool of fear and anger and frustration and craving and worship of self. Bam, we're in this series, we're talking about anchors and those things that keep us grounded and there is nothing in the world that has the power to ground us and give us meaning, nothing as universal as worship, because we are all worshiping all of the time. Everyone you know and everyone that you've ever met, they too are all worshiping all the time. But when I say the word worship, we all have different ideas, different preferences about what that is, but none of us picture what actually happens in the Bible the first time that worship shows up. When the Bible first mentions worship, it happens this way. There's a man named Abraham, and he's just out there leading his life, doing his own thing. He's got lots of property and slaves. He's got a wife and an estranged son and another son named Isaac who is living with him. And then this happens in Genesis 22. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1, says this. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, the one, on one of the mountains that I will show you. Now, you thought it was bad when you showed up for worship, when you clicked in for worship, when you pulled it up on YouTube, and they didn't sing the songs that you like, or they sang that song out of key. This story is a little more drastic it's way more difficult than just a preacher running over their time. God, Yahweh, is asking for, for sacrifice, for child sacrifice. And most of us have been around the Bible for so long that we have forgotten. We should be appalled by this. If you're reading this the first time, if you're new to Jesus, you're new to God, you're new to church, and you're just reading this for the first time, and you feel appalled by this, you should feel appalled by this. But Abraham loads up his donkey and Isaac and a few servants, and they set out to Moriah. But on the third day, stuff starts to get real. Genesis 22, 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Isn't this the craziest worship experience that you have ever heard of in your life? It's the craziest worship experience. And if you're just reading through the Bible, it's the first. The first time the Bible mentions anyone going to worship Yahweh, to worship God, the very first service. And you've read the Bible too much. And when you read this, you should think, this Yahweh guy, like he's pretty sus. We should be worried about this. And if someone were to ask you to bring a donkey to worship, 
You might think it's weird, but depending on who they were, you might do it. But if someone asks you to sacrifice your child, I don't care what you say, the answer is no. No, we're not doing that. And what's up with Abraham that he doesn't say that, that he doesn't ask it? Where are your questions, Abraham? Why are you just going along with this? Aren't you the same Abraham that just a few chapters back, you had all kinds of questions for God about Sodom and Gomorrah and you were negotiating that whole time through. But when it comes to God asking you to sacrifice your child, you're just like, sure, let's load up and go. Like, have you ever wondered why Abraham doesn't wonder? When the reason, the reason maybe that Abraham doesn't wonder is that somewhere along the line, he accepted that sacrificing Isaac was worship. Have you ever noticed how meticulous, how painstaking God can sometimes be, especially when you're reading the Old Testament? When Noah builds the ark, there are exact specifications. Later, when the Israels, Israelites build the Ark of the Covenant, there are rigid standards. There are rules and Nazarite vows and rules for war and rules for length of hair and menstruation and leprosy and dietary law. There are rules on top of rules on top of rules. But Abraham doesn't ask any questions. There's no, hey, God, how how am I supposed to sacrifice Isaac? Am I supposed to stab him, burn him, slice him? What? And what about burial? How long do I leave him out? Who else should be present? Are there any special prayers or any words that I should say? Well, Abraham doesn't ask any of these questions because Abraham lived in a culture where offering your child as a sacrifice to your God, well, that stuff happened all the time. It was par for the course. He doesn't need instructions for this. When Abraham thinks of worship, he thinks he knows what it means. And this ain't three songs and a prayer. <coughs> Worship means sacrifice. Often sacrificing your children. Worship means giving. It means who cares what you want. And in the time of Abraham, sacrificing your child at the request of the gods was everyday business. So Abraham loads up all the wood on Isaac's shoulders. I'm going to kill you, son. And you're going to have to carry the wood yourself. And they arrive at the place of sacrifice. And here's Isaac's response, starting in verse 7. Isaac said to his father, Father. And his father said, here I am, my son. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Now we get to a question, but it's from Isaac, not from Abraham. Isaac says, um, what's up with no lamb? Isaac has questions that Abraham doesn't have because like all children born to parents who weren't supposed to have children, he grew up hearing about how much his parents had prayed for him, had waited on him. He knows he's the child of the promise. He saw how Sarah had treated Ishmael and had him shipped off so Isaac could stand on top of the podium all by himself. He knows the story. All promised children are like that. You don't believe me? Ask my oldest daughter, Malia. She can tell you the stories about how doctors told her mother and I, before we were even married, that you're never going to have children. 
and how we prayed and we waited in anticipation and how we went to baby shower after baby shower and bless friend after friend as they saw their children come into the world. And finally, we got to the point where we were just done waiting and took all the money that we had saved for this one day when we we're going to have this baby. And we put a down payment on a 10 day Alaskan cruise because we knew it wasn't going to happen. And then no sooner than that, we found out my wife was pregnant. Children of the promise. They live a different life. They see the world a different way. Isaac has seen other people in other nations go off to worship and worship their own children. He knows that that's the score, that that's what happens in the world, but not for him. He's special. And when they came to the place that God had shown them, verse nine says, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, what's remarkable about this part of the story isn't Abraham, it's Isaac. Because when you read this story, at least when I read this story as a kid, and they had these little pictures and drawings and the illustrations, it always showed Abraham as a grown man and then, then Isaac as a little boy. Well, I, the scholars kind of estimate Isaac to be about, at this point, not a little boy, but about 19 years old. I, if he had been little, he wouldn't have been able to bear carrying all the wood for the sacrifice. And I don't know about you. My dad is a big man. But I remember being 19. And my guess is that if he tried to tie me down, at 19 to sacrifice me? I think I can take you, old man. But Isaac doesn't do that. The story goes on. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The angel says, do not lay a hand on the boy and or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Leading to what I have to believe is the most awkward conversation on the way back home. But that's amazing. When this story shows up in history, I have no idea how long human beings have actually walked the earth, but the first time that someone goes to worship Yahweh, someone goes to worship our God, God changes the entire equation. Everyone else in the world was sacrificing their most prized possession, their children, but when Yahweh, when worship begins of Yahweh, God says this, if you show up, I will provide. If you show up, I'll provide. Now I'm gonna tell you something that seems very old school and antiquated and top down, but let me know if it's not the case, if I'm wrong. And if you do, I'll recant. And here it is. And when it comes to the worship of our God, God's job is to provide. Our job is to show up, to be attentive, to be present, to live in expectation and anticipation of what God is doing in the world, that when we hear the voice of God, that we respond with obedience and love, that we hold nothing back, that we offer ourselves and we offer all that we have, all that we have been given by God and say to God, the reason I have this is because of you, because you have been faithful and I hold it with open hands to give it back to you. And as some of us have this idea 
that worship is only doing certain things at a certain place at a certain time with a certain group of people. And that's certainly a part of it because it is important to show up. And even when we're in a time of COVID and you're sitting on your couch and you're with your family around the kitchen table and you're watching this online, or maybe you're in the room and it seems so distracted and distant and people are over there and I'm over here and we've all got masks on, that God is saying, you still need to show up. And I am providing that right now in this moment of your life that I am providing that when things don't look like you want them to look, whether it's financial reversal or someone in your family is sick, when people are dying around you, when things aren't headed in the direction that you think they ought to head, either as a church or a community or as a country, you show up with faithfulness, with obedience, with open handed living. And I will provide like this is the message of God, that when we are present and attentive to the work he is doing. When we choose in all of the haze, in all of the decisions to worship money or power or position or education or looks, when we have those options to worship all of those things, that we say, I will worship God and God alone, that I will give back to the one who has given me, that not only am I a child of a promise that everything I have is a result of God's promises, and that I am committing that in my speech, in my attitude toward others, in loving people who are hard for me to love, that I'm going to show up. And I'm going to be obedient to God and trust that God is taking care of things that I cannot see. In this story, this story what's called the binding of Isaac, just ask us to show up when God calls. And that is worship. Three times in Genesis 22, Abraham is asked questions. And three times he responds the same way. Here I am. And that's the question for all of us right now. So where are you right now? Because you can go through all of the motions and not worship God. You can be distant in your affections for brothers and sisters in Christ. You can have people that you hate because of the way they think, the way they act, the way they voted, the way they live, and not worship God. Worshiping God is about having hearts that are attuned to what God is doing in the world and joining God in that, not always knowing where the sacrifice is going to come from. Or maybe it is always knowing where the sacrifice is going to come from. And we free ourselves knowing that God will provide. Because as David Foster Wallace told us, the worship of anything else will eat us alive. Bama, let me pray for you. God, give us a deep worship of who you are and what you are doing. Give us eyes to see and ears that hear and feet, God, that move in your direction. And in these very turbulent times, may we be people who worship you and you alone, not our ideas, not our wishes, not our country, not an idea about our country, not our children, not our spouses, not our schools, not returning to normal, that we don't worship any of that. We worship you and trust that you are at work in our world in powerful ways, both in ways we can see and ways we cannot. And we ask it in the name of your only son, Jesus Christ. Amen.